and welcome to church. So good to see you, or at least half of you. So good to be in the house of the Lord together and to worship his name. Praise God. Well, can we actually, can we just, can we just give praise to God that we're here together right now? It is so good to see you. It really is. Well, praise God. I'm really looking forward to the next five weeks together. We're going to be going through the 23rd Psalm, one of the most endeared passages of Scripture over the last, well, three millennia. And so we have this privilege of going through it together. And what you can do is go ahead and put your bookmark on the 23rd Psalm. You can... uh, Start studying it yourself maybe for the next five weeks, going deeper and deeper and deeper into it. There's so much in these six verses. I'm a little embarrassed actually to be preaching from this text because as I was diving into it more and more, I realized that what do I have to say when there's saints in our church that have been walking with the Lord for so much longer and have experienced him as shepherd for so much longer that maybe the things I would say are just immature. But what we can be sure of is that the Holy Spirit, as we together look at this magnificent text, can speak to each of our hearts. And so I pray that you'd be relying on him. I would also encourage you, maybe um, make it a habit, but for the next five weeks, why not pray this psalm back to the Lord every day? Why not start memorizing this Psalm, maybe along with the Lord's Prayer, pray this psalm. Pray this psalm back to God. There's perhaps not a more, com- more comforting words that we could pray back to God than the 23rd psalm. So this is what I want to do. I want to read the psalm together. I want us all to read it together. We can't sing, but we can talk, and we can read out loud the Lord's words to him. So I want us to do that, and then I'll pray. I'm going to give a little intro to our series, and then we'll get into our verses for today. So why don't you stand with me with your Bible, or it'll be up on the screen as well. And at ho- if you're at home, you can stand in your living room and read the psalm with us as well. Psalm 23. Let's read this together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that we have a good shepherd. Lord, thank you that we are called your sheep. Lord, we give thanks to you and we praise you, Lord, that even now we can come together and we can look at your word knowing that your Holy Spirit is willing and wanting to teach us and to draw us in closer to you. God, I pray that you would do that now. Lord, help us, Lord, help me as I preach through a psalm that has meant so much for so many people for so long. Lord, you are good, and we love you, and we need you. Be with us now, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. This entire psalm really hinges off of the first five words. The Lord is my shepherd. David, who wrote this psalm, we're not sure exactly when he wrote it, but he does not write, the Lord was my shepherd, or he will be my shepherd, but he writes, he is my shepherd. There is no ifs. He doesn't just hope that the Lord will be his shepherd. Again, He is my shepherd, the psalmist writes. The Lord being his shepherd is a very active and present thing. 
the emphasis on my should be so open and obvious to us. The Lord is my shepherd. Each of us can say that if you believe in Jesus Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. It's personal. And it should mean so much to us that the Lord, maybe he's the shepherd of others, but one thing is for sure, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord being David's shepherd is a very active and present thing. The Lord is currently and clearly, actively and actually his shepherd. There's a Baptist preacher by the name of F. W. Borham in England, and he recalled a story in one of his books of a friend of his um, named Reverend J. A. Golt. Uh, Golt was a minister during the First World War. He served as a chaplain in the war, and before his men that he would oversee and help, before they would go out to the firing line, he would have them recite the first five words of this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. In fact, he did this thing called the five finger exercise and he would have them with their right hand point to their left hand and he would say, the Lord is my shepherd. And he would have them take a little marker or a pencil and, and put that on their fingers so they would never forget, the Lord is my shepherd with extra emphasis on the my. And he would have them memorize it and say it again and again and again as they went into battle because even as they're going into battle, the one thing that we need to know, even if it's right before we're going to die, is the Lord is my shepherd. One of his young men went into battle, and after the battle, he was found dead. And they found him there with his right hand gripped firmly around his left index finger. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is not just a shepherd, he is my shepherd. Allow that truth to sink into your heart as you recite this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. The psalmist here and you as well, if you are saying these words, you're admitting to something that outside of the Christian faith, not many would ever care to admit. That we are in fact sheep. David knew that he was a sheep. In fact, he was glad to be a sheep. That he was not the Lord over his own life. That David was not David's king. But instead, it is the Lord who is his shepherd and is our shepherd. It is the Lord who we submit under. He knows that David knew, as writing this psalm, he knew that he was unable to lead himself to green pastures and still waters. And we need to know this as well, that the Lord is my shepherd. Only the one who knows the Lord truly wants to and is readily admitting this truth, that we are sheep. But the one who knows the Lord, the person who knows the character of the Lord, the person who knows the deep and the eternal love of our God, the sacrifice that he has made and the mercy that he has shown to us, we know that the best thing to be is a sheep in the Lord's flock. There's no sweeter thing. It's the sweetest and the best place to be. It's the best relationship that we can have. To further this point, I think we need to take notice of where the 23rd Psalm sits in the book of Psalms, right after the 22nd Psalm. And the 22nd Psalm, of course, is the Psalm of the Cross. The Psalm that Jesus Christ himself recites as he's hanging on the cross about to pay for the sins of the world. You see, for us to know that the Lord is my shepherd, we must also know that he is worthy of being our shepherd. First, we must go to the cross and understand who he is and what he has done to then be able to go to the 23rd Psalm 
and go from my God, my God, why have you forsaken me to the Lord is my shepherd. Like David, we must see the Lord in this way, as our shepherd. We must say it personally. He is my shepherd. He cares for me. He loves me. He protects me. He leads me and he watches over me. Today we're going to be looking at the first two verses. But every week, every week we're in this psalm, we're coming back to the first five words. The Lord is my shepherd. And each week in this series, we're going to have three points that come right out of the text. And so let's look at our first points this week. And here's our heading. It'll be the same every week. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I can be secure in provision. I can be secure in provision. Look at what immediately follows one of the sweetest lines in scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. Since the Lord is our shepherd, we are secure in our provision. We shall not want. The one who is a sheep in the flock of God will always be provided for. There is no shortage for those who call the Lord their shepherd. In the Hebrew, it's quite emphatic. It's, the Lord is my, shop, my, the Lord is my shepherd. I want nothing. I want nothing. What else could I want? So much in life we long for things and we want stuff and we feel we're lacking in different areas in our lives. And, but with the Lord as our shepherd, I shall not want. Here's a few things we often find want in. Leadership. We want good leadership. But the Lord will perfectly lead us. More to come on this point in a moment, but the leadership we have in Christ is perfect. It leaves us wanting nothing else. When we know the plan that God has for our lives, when we know the vision he casts for our life, that he's working all things together for good for us, we, we don't want any other leader. And any earthly leader we have, all that they can do that is helpful is point us towards the leadership of Christ. The Lord is our shepherd. We want nothing else. In John 10, 11, Jesus says that he is the good shepherd, and he truly is. Jesus is the good shepherd, perfect in leadership. How about this? We're often wanting an example. We want good example, don't we? Not just for us, but even for our kids. We say, hey, hang out with people that will be a good example. We want a good example to help us make good decisions as we move forward. And all of these things are good, and there's nothing wrong with it, but when we look at the example of Christ, and we see what he has done, really we can say, I, I shall not want. I shall not want. He is the greatest example, isn't he, church? Philippians 2 says that Christ humbled himself. He counted himself less significant. He, he showed us perfectly what we are to do for one another as well. How about this? Look at the mercy as provided. Are you, are you wanting in mercy? But the Lord is your shepherd. He's provided the, the perfect amount and the endless amount of mercy for us, which is new every morning. How could we possibly want more? Is there any more mercy to have? All of our punishment is gone. All of our sin taken away. We are totally and completely set free from death. Our gift of mercy is complete. Ephesians 2, 4 says that God is rich in mercy. How about his grace? How about his grace? Has he not given us all the grace that is available? We want nothing. We shall want nothing. How is there anything more to want when the Lord is our shepherd and he's provided us all of this grace? He's given us the grace of his eternal, eternal life in his presence. He has given us peace, and it can only come through knowing him. 
2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Grace. Grace. How can we want more when the Lord is our shepherd? He's provided everything. Three more. How about this? Joy. Joy. Do you want more joy? There's no more joy to be had than the joy that is in Jesus Christ. Our good shepherd gives us so much joy. 1 Peter 1.8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. The Lord has given you a joy that is inexpressible. How about in life in general? Are you left wanting in life? Not with Christ. Because in Christ now we truly and actually live. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. If the Lord is your shepherd, you are a new creation. There is no wanting in life. How about in death? How about in death? 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we are not wanting in death. We're not wondering in death. We're not scared of death. We're not frightened by death. We look forward to it in one way because when we die in this body, we will be ushered into the presence of God. We have no concern over our eternal resting place. We are not left wanting. The Lord is our shepherd. Look at these sweet words again and notice the promise hidden within them. It says, shall. I shall not want. The word shall gives us hope for the future, doesn't it? It is not just that right now I shall not want, but I shall never want. I shall not want means it's a future tense. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what comes our way, the Lord will provide. If we see famine or disaster, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. If we see persecution or hatred, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. If we face poverty, I shall not want because the Lord is my shepherd. When we go through any kind of trial, I shall not want because the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord will always care for his sheep. There's never been a time that we need to be anxious about tomorrow when the Lord is our shepherd. We might not have everything we wish for, but we have everything we need. Even the things in our life that we wish we didn't have, God even uses those. We don't need to wonder if the Lord will provide We know that he will provide. I shall not want. Let's look at the next line of the text. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. You see, the Lord is my shepherd. I I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I can be graciously fed. I can be graciously fed. In verse 2, we see two very important parts of the Christian life. As Charles Spurgeon put it, we see the contemplative in he makes me lie down in green pastures, and we see the active in um, he leads me beside still waters. The contemplative and the active. Contemplative meaning what we think about, what happens in our mind, and then the active, obviously, what we do with our hands and our feet. But what are these green pastures? What are these green pastures? He makes me lie down in green pastures. It's a wonderful word picture. The kind and loving shepherd leading his sheep to the green pastures that are rich and full of nutrients for the sheep. Not a dry and crispy grass, like if you were to come to my house and look at my lawn, but grass that is cooling in the day and nice to sit on and relaxing and refreshing. 
where there is comfort for the sheep, where they can be next to their shepherd. You see, the green pastures, the green pastures, these good green pastures, they're reserved for the flock of the good shepherd. Only those who say, the Lord is my shepherd, have access to the green pastures. This is where his beloved are fed. And these green pastures, of course, are the words of Scripture. They are refreshing to the soul and they feed the hungry in spirit. Let me encourage you in this way. Right now, a lot's been going on. But what's on your mind right now? What are you struggling with? with? What are, you, what are you facing in your life today? What stresses in your life are you experiencing? Are you struggling in your marriage? Struggling as a parent? Maybe overwhelmed with the routine of life, paying the bills, getting work done, doing what you have to do? Is there a hidden sin that is so deeply burdening you, and so for many years it seems like you haven't been able to loosen its effects? I'll tell you the one thing you need. You need rest. You need restoration. Allow the Lord to lie you down in his green pasture. The world's worries will not go away for us until we leave this world and join in the heavenly chorus in eternity. I can tell you this, there'll be no face masks in heaven. And we'll sing loudly. But until that time, we have this sweet option of feasting on green pastures that will satisfy your soul and bring peace beyond understanding. You need rest. You need to go to the green pastures. Sitting in the shepherd's green pastures does not mean we are taken away from the realities of this life, but it means that we have the ability to get through this life with joy and with peace. Resting our minds in the green pastures of scripture will bring satisfaction to your soul. But if we're not in the green pastures, if you don't go to the green pastures, the, the reason why you're not there is because you're somewhere else. What pastures have you been lying in? What pastures have you been going to? What wisdom have you been relying on? Many brothers and sisters sit in the pasture of emotion. This is not a green pasture. It's often, often bitterly brown. Our emotions take us up and they take us down and when they rule us, we have no peace but only fear and anxiety. The person who is sitting in the pasture of emotion is always seeing everything in the, in the light of offense. Viewing what other people say always with the worst intentions. Always seeing how they have hurt me. Emotions go up and down and there are no place to put our hope. And there's no place to sit in. Emotions are great and they're given to you by God, but only when their foundation is in the truth. When you sit in a green pasture and allow your emotions to come out of the overwhelming in your heart and soul of what God has done for you and what he is speaking to you, allow these emotions to be your emotions. Many people sit in the pasture of pleasure, whether it be food or drink or 
pornography or drugs. The escape from reality for a moment for a quick fleshly experience. You know, these pastures are very deceiving because they look green. They look green and you think it's gonna be really good but as you get closer you realize it's not grass, the green leaf is poison ivy. And we lie down and roll around in these pastures of poison and only within a few days can it lead to death. Many sit in the pasture of selfishness. The thought at first makes sense to the flesh to sit in the pasture of selfishness. If I look out for myself, if I seek my own benefit, then I'll get what I want and I'll be satisfied. And instead of serving my wife, I serve myself. Instead of serving my kids, I serve myself. Instead of seeking the betterment of my employee or my employers, I assume that it's all about me. I assume help from friends, but I never offer it. Unfortunately, this is never the case, is it? When we sit in these pastures, when we sit in the pasture of selfishness, when we feast on the idea that the world exists to serve us and my wants, we're only filled with disappointment and anger. There's no rest there. Instead, we need to lie down in the shepherd's green pastures that he has so graciously brought us to, to feed us. He knows, our good shepherd, he knows that there's no satisfaction in these other pastures. He knows that we need his word to fill us. Just like Jeremiah says in chapter 15, verse 16, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Your words were found and I ate them. Green pastures. It's where I go to restore and be filled and rested. Jeremiah, just like David, knew that the word of God is what would satisfy and give joy. These are the pastures that we must sit in as well. Abandon the rotting pastures of this world and follow the good shepherd to the green feeding pastures of his word. Go to the word. Go to the word. Be in the word. Study God's word. Allow it to satisfy your soul. Notice the psalmist writes, he makes me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. It is the Lord who has made it possible for us to see the beauty of his word. What a privilege. You see, only the sheep of the Lord know the beauty of his word. As the spirit has sealed you and opened up your eyes, you're able now to see the word of God as not a divisive book, not a historical book, but the living true word of God that will feed us and lead us. These pastures are for you. The Lord has given you everything you need, the spirit of God and the word of God, waiting to refresh your soul and bring you joy. He will make you lie down in green pastures. What does he do next? He leads me beside still waters. Praise God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want He leads me beside still waters. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I can be calmly led. I can be calmly led. He leads me beside still waters. In the line above, we saw the contemplative part, where we go for our minds to be refreshed, our souls to be refreshed in the Christian life, and here we see the active part. We are made to lie down and feast on the word of God, yes, but... Although we consistently go back to the word of God and eat there, we're not always there. We also go out into the world. We are also to act out what we have learned from his word. We are to be sanctified in the acting out of our changed and refreshed heart. 
the leading we receive beside the still waters is the influences and the graces of the Holy Spirit. The influences and the graces of the Holy Spirit. He leads you. He leads you. And just like water, the Spirit will lead you and cleanse you and refresh you as he leads you through this world. The imagery here is so helpful for us in understanding how the Holy Spirit desires to lead us. You see, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of peace. He's a spirit of peace. This is the fruit that he bears within us, along with love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He, he leads us in peace, still waters. I don't know if there's anything more relaxing than the thought of being near Slowly moving still waters, trickling down a stream. Still waters. When we face the storms in life, and the waves are just too large for us to bear, it is Christ who calmly walks out into the storm, isn't it? Do you remember this story? I believe it's Mark 6 and John 6. The disciples are out in a boat, and the storm is coming in and the waves are crashing onto the boat and they're taking on water and they think they're going to die. It's too much to bear, but then there is Christ who comes walking out to them as if he's on still waters. And when Jesus approaches the boat, he even calls Peter to come and join him on the raging sea and to walk as if they are still waters. See, even in the storm, even when the waves are crashing on, even when you're going through trial and hardship and difficulty and, and everything that's going on in your life, whether it's sin or someone else's sin that's going on in your life, whether it's your marriage or your kids or whatever's happening, when the storm and the waves are crashing in, even in the storm waters, there is calm when we are being led by the Spirit of God. And only when we're being led by the Spirit of God. What storms are you facing? And maybe only you know what's going on in your life and you feel alone in this, but listen, listen. The Lord knows the storm and he sees that it's all consuming. And he sees that there's no way out for you. And he knows that if you remain in there, it's going to consume you. He knows this unless you follow him unless you follow him, unless you take to his leading. Lean into his leading and the storms of life will seem but a calm walk beside the still waters. My hope is that for many of you, I don't actually need to convince you that the Lord is your shepherd. And maybe just remind you of the still waters that he has led you by for so many years. And maybe this is a good time in your own heart to just pause and reflect and recall how the Lord has led you in so many ways over so many years. Have you experienced the calming sound of the still water that in Christ you have? Have you seen him work through a situation? Bring that to mind. Lord, you, you worked in this situation. It seemed impossible. But God, with you, it was like walking beside still waters. Maybe even this past week, have you, have you sat with your Savior and enjoyed his company even through the hurricane of life? It's possible. If it's too hard for you to remember the sweetness of God, or maybe you've never experienced the sweetness and the calm that comes from following our Savior, don't worry. The Lord still is your shepherd or can be your shepherd. He wants to lead you to the still waters of his grace. He wants you to experience what it is to be led to green pastures and still waters. Christian, you have not gone so far that the good shepherd is unable to bring you back. 
He is the one who leaves the 99 and goes after the one. He will bind up your wounds and he will sit you closest to him that you may rest at his feet. Do not be embarrassed, do not be ashamed. Just be comforted by the grace of God. How sweet it is to be led by the gracious spirit of God. How calming it is to know that we are secure in his flock. Don't allow another day to go by where you have not relied on the feeding and the leading of your good shepherd. Memorize this psalm. Recite it to yourself daily. Don't allow your mind to drift drift off to other pastures. Don't be deceived by the waves of the consuming life we have here. The good shepherd will not leave you wanting for anything else if you follow him. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, thank you for being our shepherd. Lord, you are my shepherd. Lord, thank you for the sweet truth that in you, Lord, we are not left wanting. You've supplied for every need. You have, you've helped us in every way. You've given us everything we need, Lord. And Lord, you give us green pastures. You lead us beside still waters, Lord. You truly are a gracious God. Lord, help us, Lord, remember who you are and what you have done and, Lord, the access that we have to the good shepherd right now. Lord, calm our spirits. Lord, allow us to sit at the feet of our Savior and enjoy what he has given to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.